We're doing a session on methods, budgets, and communication. Um, I'm Jim Plank and just going to continue a conversation that we had in an earlier video. So glad you're with us and I'm going to talk to all of you just together with the video again and this thing is driving me crazy. Um, <laughs> but anyway, just kind of, we're going to kind of unpack what we talked in the first session a little bit more, some more specifics. Uh, I gave you a really quick 30 minute shot through and now you're all ready to launch your first multi-site so go do it next Sunday and we'll all be good, all right? Report back how that goes for you and then I'll learn more and we'll have more information I could share. Um, just kind of methods, budgets, and communication and I've got uh, Laura in here with me because the whole part of this thing is, you know, we can do all these things and talk about all these things but the really the challenging part of doing it well and doing it so that people aren't mad at each other at the end of the day and that you have a church that's really a church that loves each other is keeping communication open and keeping good lines of communication that are healthy, okay? Um, I've got plenty of experiences I could share with you on how, that, how not to do that. I have a feel on how to do it. I'll let Laura talk more about how to do it well because uh, her team does a great job of kind of helping keep us on track, right? Um, just to let you know kind of how the communication works on a normal basis. So we have a meeting uh, with our, all of our campus pastors come in on Tuesday and we do a meeting where we're all in that meeting for about two hours or we call it our, um, yeah, what do we call it? SLT meeting. <laughs> Think about what we call it, site leadership team. We change names all the time so it's hard to keep it straight in my head. Uh, forgive me if I say the wrong acronyms, but anyway. Um, so, th so that's kind of what we, how we do things as far as staying in communication with each other. There are many things to miscommunicate on, and if you know this to be true, because we're all leaders, but in multi-site particularly, you're like, in our case, we're running, we're having five churches, six if you count our online campus, and seven if you count the Mandarin service, which is over in the area where we were, that are all trying to communicate and trying to communicate the same message at the end of the day, right? That's, that's our goal. Um, it is a huge task to keep everything going the same direction. And so, like Laura's team, for instance, Laura is in almost all of those meetings with those different people, and kind of part of their task is to keep us all together and kind of go in the same direction. So it works um, until it doesn't, I guess, but, but our intention is really to be intentional about communication and keeping it all going in the same direction. So if your church is getting ready to launch a multi-site um, multi kind of menu for, for churches and kind of like putting it out there, I would highly recommend that you look for somebody who could kind of take your communication lead and then have that person kind of involved in each piece of the pie and then somebody's just assimilating information as you go through. It's really helpful. Um, Laura does a great job, but it, that really is a crucial part because otherwise there's no one who's in all those meetings and there's so many different meetings. You know this if you're in a very large church that you know, you've got your speaking team meeting, you've got uh, your speaking pastors who meet, you've got your weekend experience people who meet, you've got your campus leadership team who meets and somebody's kind of got to be keeping that information <coughs> together. Um, working as an executive pastor, I just know I'm not the person to do that uh, most of the time because I've got a lot of other things going on that I'm trying to work with and that's, that's really crucial. So think about that and you're talking about budgets. Um, you might want to think about putting into your budget somebody who's the communication specialist to kind of keep you all going the same direction um, as you move forward. So maybe you've kind of put numbers in already. Maybe you kind of know dollars and cents. I don't know where you're at in the process of developing a multi-site budget. I would encourage you to um, get some basic numbers from people who've done it before. It's helpful. It may not be you, okay? Uh, but there are definite costs involved and know how you're going to handle those things. Talk through budgets. And I'll give you some dollars and cents of what we do here, but I know that you're going to have to take it back and probably apply it to wherever it is that you live and inflate it or decrease it or whatever to make it work. Um, so as we look at different models, um, what I'm going to look at today is kind of what's worked for us. Don't think this is the only model. There are other models out there that I know have worked for people. We have done a lot of communication with Seacoast Church out of uh, South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina, and then we have also worked with Community Christian out of Naperville. And we've modeled a lot of things that we do after those guys. They've been successful. Like, I don't, I don't see a need to reinvent the wheel. Um, I think kind of what works for them probably works for us. But also tweaking it to realize that we are in a rural area, they're not. It, you know, so you have to work it to your system and where you are. But um, there is enough information out of multi-sites right now that you don't really have to reinvent a lot of things. You just need to go pick the things that work for you and make sure that you include that. Uh, Happy uses his language. He said, you know, he kind of felt like what the word he's heard over and over is you can borrow from anyone, but don't try to copy anyone, try to be them. 
I, th it, I think that's kind of true in this model too. Like, there's lots of things you can borrow from different churches and kind of create your own things. Um, but there's not really a reason that we all have to make the same mistake. So, um, you know, I told you the campus that we had that didn't, didn't survive. Um, you know, we were, we, were, we were counseled well to not do that, but we thought that we were different, right? So we can pull, we can surely make this one work, right? I just, my encouragement to churches is like, let's quit thinking that we're God, okay? Let's just like, let's operate within what God's called us to. Um, and let's not get carried away with thinking that we're something like specialer than we are. Uh, so we're just people allowing God to work through us and we're not the, the ones that can do it. So several consider considerations I think that we have to look at. Um, we talked about earlier, it's just like, are we going to share? Are you going to rent share space? Are you going to rent space? Or are you going to lease space? Like that's probably... Um, how are you going to do that? So you need to think about those things. The whole meth the me message thing, I want to just cover that a little bit more. I just I kind of just shot right through it last time. Pretty big decision is how are you going to do the message? Um, will you do one week delay? We started that way. Um, I'll give you some pros and cons on that. Uh, the pros really are this, and that is the new campuses always kind of get the best product. Like they get the one that's been edited, if it needs to be edited, they get the one that's got nice cleaned up edges. It's all on video, right? It's all on DVD. It's cheaper. The system is much less expensive to buy a $300 DVD player. Don't buy a cheap DVD player, I can tell you that. We tried that. Mouth and words, mouth and screen don't go together on cheap ones if you pause them. Um, just a little side note. So if you have a DVD player that does that, it's too cheap. Don't do it. Spend about $350 on a DVD player and it'll take care of all of those problems. We figured that out after we had all kinds of issues. Um, it gives the campus pastor more peace of mind. If, you, if, if I know that my guy is pushing the DVD, I don't have to worry about a stream coming down, I pretty much know it's going to work, unless there's something major happens. It allows me to preview the service. So uh, when we were doing DVD on Thursday, I'd get the message on uh, Wednesday. And on Thursday, I would watch the DVD. I'd sit down and watch the DVD. It's the first thing I did. I had my schedule all set. Thursday morning, I watched the DVD. If there's any questions, I call the pastor who's speaking, and I say, what did you mean by this so that I can translate it right? So that's a good thing. Um, it's easy to plan service flow. You know exactly to the second how long that is. Uh, we were doing three services, and I knew that if uh, we, have, we have one pastor who speaks a little longer many times, and I won't name names, and everybody's laughing. They all know who I'm talking about. But we used to have to edit the video because I, I was running three services, and we were running them back to back. We just, you know, we only had a few minutes to get people in and out, so we had to cut. So you can do that. Live streaming, you can't do that as well. So those are the pros. Cons are this kind of... It's really hard to do things with time references. So somebody says, hey, you know, Christmas Day is tomorrow. And you're like, oh, no, Christmas Day is not tomorrow. Christmas Day was last week. And those kind of time references are really, do not feel good on the campus. They feel very old and kind of out of date. And it feels a little weird when somebody prays and you realize it was last week's prayer. But usually you can get over that part of it. Um, the other thing is things like... Um, juggling around holidays, like figuring out, like Easter, we often speak live. So if you think with me for just a minute, so we're week delayed, right? So the week before Easter, that's the message I would have showed on Easter, but I'm going to speak live that weekend. But the next week then, what message do I show? Because I didn't have the Easter message to show the week after Easter, right? It becomes, and we spent hours <laughs> muddling through that, and hours and hours. Um, so we always had to juggle things wrong. It complicates things like programs. So like your communications person drives them crazy because they're producing programs for this week and programs for the week past um, as far as any like who's speaking and all those kind of things. So that's kind of a negative. Um, if some, you have people who travel between campuses that are a little closer. So if they were here the last week and they come out to, let's say, Paxton because it's close, they're going to hear the same message twice. Um, we heard pushback on that quite a bit. So that's, that's kind of the, the downside there. The next thing you can do, we basically say you can do one week delay, one day delayed, or one minute delayed, right? So the one day delayed is this. And we did this for a while. And this, this is workable. It, it's not terrible. Um, so Saturday night's message would be uploaded to Google Drive. I'm watching for Chris to go like this because I, I try to remember this for sure. But we'd upload it to Google Drive. It gets posted out of here first. That's true, yeah. So the, the, the negative is he's, he's editing here for three hours on Saturday night and then uploading it. Then my guys on my end, on the campus pastor end, are downloading it on Saturday night, preferably Saturday night, so I'm doing it Sunday morning, not a good idea. Remember backup plan? Yeah. Um, 
So you download it on Saturday night and you just make sure it's going to run. That's, that's the idea of that. So they're getting done at midnight. Yeah, they're getting done at midnight. So that's kind of a, that's kind of a negative. Um, but it works. Not very expensive. Same message. Um, it's downloaded, so that's good. The pros of this are, the, are a couple things. First of all, you get synced up message right first weekend, not first day, but weekend. So that reference to Christmas and all those things kind of is really okay now. Um, holidays are much, much, much easier to navigate. You just go one off, one on, and you breeze right through it. Um, the editing and the messages can be done well or thoughtfully, so I'm not just getting whatever was said. So Chris might need to cut something out or do a little nice little thing here or there with a video. We can do that. Um, and it, the other thing is, as much as we tried, it was hard to keep people from saying this evening. Welcome to the vineyard this evening. How are you guys all doing tonight? And on Sunday morning, it doesn't play very well. <laughs> um, there again, that's not huge. I think it's not a big deal. It's deep, but it's kind of devaluing. Say, so you put yourself on the other end, you're sitting there watching it, and you're like, oh, gee. So this was last night. You know, it doesn't feel real great. So that was kind of a negative. Um, the uploading and downloading of files are huge. Like these, we're running HD, so those few files are gigantic. It takes a long time. Occasionally, if you don't have great downloads, which my house is one of those, uh, you know, you have issues. So that's not good. Um, but those, but for the most part, you know, it's 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 an inexpensive way to do it. Um, kind of some of the things are things like that are really negatives. Um, that even though you got some issues with Saturday nights and those kind of things, the the biggest issue is just the time constraints. So it now now you're putting time on a guy like Chris. You're putting another three hours on his day. Uh, your people who are your, out on your campuses who are usually your volunteers who are downloading this, you're asking them to do this on Saturday night, late at night. Um, it works, and it doesn't work too bad, but there is an element of live that is just different. Um, it seems crazy, and people, people hardly believe this until they experience it, but even today, so you guys got to experience today, so Dave's live, right? You knew that. Um, but if Dave would have been talking yesterday or on DVD, it would not have felt the same. So your experience that you had, and one of the reasons we did it in the way we did is we wanted that experience for people, just to kind of experience what does live feel like. Generally, the quality is fantastic, and you don't have all the pixelation and all that stuff that we had today. For whatever reason, the feed was on his end. Our end here was 100 down, right? So we should have had no problem. Um, but it's, it's one of those things. Um, so it's worked well for us, to really, to record. But what we found when we went to live was people just noticed. Like, the people in the audience started, they started noticing. They're like, hey... Hap's talking about this morning. He's talking about right now. He's talking about the snowstorm that just happened yesterday, which was Saturday. I mean, all of those things bring an, an element of value. So it, you start value, valuing the people that you're at your, at your outlying campuses, and it, it feels different. Um, it's a lot easier on the speaker. Yeah, it's easier on the speaker. The speaking pastor has an easier time, and it's way easier on the tech guy. <laughs> so Chris shuts it off and goes home, right? Um, so that, that's really helpful. Um, you know, some of the cons of that is things like bandwidth. It's expensive to have the bandwidth that you really need if you're in a remote area. Sometimes it's challenging. We're in a very remote area. You know, we have, we have a wireless provider. We have actually two providers. Um, we have a wireless provider that can only give us six down, which is barely enough. It's squeaking by. Um, and it's wireless, so it's dependent on the weather sometimes, whether or not we can get it. Uh, we have a wired provider that provides us with 15, but it happens to be this company, I probably shouldn't say the name of, that doesn't do a very good job. <laughs> There. Uh, so, you know, it depends on your, what you have available. If you have great supply available, it works really well. Um, and even when you're not, it's not fantastic, that's not great. Uh, it's, when the feed's not fantastic, it works. It's just not as, quite as good. Um, negative being live, we had a fire drill here, or actually a fire alarm, actually. Um, and one of our campuses thought it was their, <laughs> thought it was their place that the fire alarm was going <laughs> off. So that's kind of negative, um, but it feels live. Um, so those are some of the things. So that kind of covers that section of live. Are you going to make that decision up front? How are you going to do that? Are you going to invest the money? And we'll talk about the investment at the end of it in a minute. Um, the other thing you have to decide of kind of is, are you going to be a portable church or are you going to have a dedicated building? So, yes, Chris. What's your protocol if the streaming does not work on your end as a campus pastor? You forgot that element. Oh, yeah, which I talked about earlier when I had to preach live. So the streaming goes down and you're the campus pastor. That's right, you were setting up when I told him the story. 
you're on, right? So you, it's important that you know what the message is about and that you have the transcript in your hands. Um, so when you're sitting in the front row and you're watching the video, you better have the transcript in your hand. Actually, the Sunday that that happened, I didn't have it with me, but my tech guy, Daryl, backed me up. He's like, here you go, you need this? <laughs> I said, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, so, so it worked out well. But that's the protocol. And so since we do a preaching team on Tuesday, we get to hear that message. Um, and also, we actually have that message on a, the way we stream, and we'll talk about that later, but we actually have Saturday nights available too. So if the campus pastor for some reason is gone on Tuesday on vacation or whatever, they could watch the Saturday night message and, and, and pick it up. So that's helpful to know. Um, We need, if you think about your building space, so back to that part of it, if you're going to do portable, uh, I think a decision that you need to make, I'm getting this from other people who have told me they did, did portable, they kind of need to know how long, like you need to have some idea how long that might be. Like give your team an expectation, okay? Uh, when we did three services, for instance, I told them, look, we're going to do this for this amount of time. And then we actually ended up going six months longer than that, but it was helpful for them to know. <laughs> It's helpful for them to know. We at least had a plan. It didn't work, but we had a plan. You know, and one of the things, I, I'll just add this. One of the things you can do when you're doing things like that, with, especially with volunteers, is make it fun. Like one of the things we did was in our VLT, I gave the top 10 reasons why we, should, why we needed to have three services. You know, my drummer is involved, and so he's doing stuff too, and, and making it fun. Like, so at the end of that, I'm like, you know, one of the, the top reason, number one reason is because two services will seem like nothing. You know, people are laughing, but at the end of the day, when we, things were a little tough, I could say, remember what I told you from the very beginning? They're like, yeah, two services will seem like nothing. You know, it helps to kind of add expectation for people. It's like, what are you doing? So um, another thing is for Sunday, what kind of space will you need and how much, like what's the cost involved? So here we go to budget, okay? Um, if you're sharing space with an existing church, which is a possibility, do they have kids space available? Do they have revolution space available on a Wednesday night if you do a Wednesday night service for your kids? Um, what's the relational space? What's the parking like? Like anything you would think of of a regular church. For some reason, I see this happen a lot. We look at a multi-site possibility and we don't look at the, we don't look at it as a church. So we forget to look at kids space and parking. All of those things, like it doesn't matter if it's a multi-site church, it's a church, right? So all of those things are crucial. Like people don't want to go steps. They don't want to, I mean, there's just all those things. So keep that in mind as you look for space. Um, Decide kind of what your expectations are. How long will you do something? How long will you stay a certain place? How long will you be portable? How long will you need a team of people to come in and set up and tear down? All, like know those expectations up front. Um, I would say your, your first campus will probably be less expensive. That'll probably be your least expensive campus, most likely. Here's why. I'm, I'm living proof of this, okay? What you get is you get seconds. Now, granted, I complained, I, I, I admit it, right? But the truth is, you can do with some of the things that, that the ascending church does is, are, their second, are their seconds. It's like the stuff that they don't use anymore, or you can use their monitoring system, or you can use some of their PA system, or wh whatever the things are that you need. Um, so from a campus pastor standpoint, that sounds kind of negative. From a sending pastor standpoint, that's a positive, because you can, you can launch this for a lot less, right? So you can use the chairs, you know, we got some chairs that look exactly like that. Not with the hole in it, but uh, <laughs> that looked like that in one of our campuses. And the reason we do is because we were getting rid of some here. We're like, hey, let's just transfer them down there, which saved us about $100 a chair, right? So those are things that you can do. Um, know what your staffing expectations are. Here's one of your fill in the blanks, by the way. Um, staffing expectations, pay or no pay, and what positions will be compensated. Know it up front. Don't try to figure it out on the fly or you'll get some body that's paid at one campus that's not paid at another campus and those two people will talk and you think they won't talk but they will talk and and they promise you that they won't say anything if you pay me a thousand dollars a month but they do and then you get in trouble all right so <laughs> make sure you know what those expectations are um, know if it will be if it will be volunteers or what I would like to call unpaid staff okay or if it's gonna be paid staff know, know that up front um, Here's what we think about budget. We think budgets are gonna run $75,000 to $100,000 to launch a campus. Um, we launched in Sullivan for less than that, considerably less than that, uh, but mostly because we had equipment that was secondhand, like I told you. Um, we had a lot of elbow grease going to the, you know, getting stuff ready, and uh, 
some of our other campuses did the same thing. So it, it depends, but I think, if, I think you're selling yourself way short to think you're going to launch for less than 75. Um, and that depends on where you are too. So, you know, probably up to 100 and uh, at 100,000, I, I like to kind of like, you're getting a six figure, so now you're talking about something that's kind of a much bigger risk. So you better have pretty good control of what's going on. Um, kind of a budget range in building. We look at about 1,500 to 3,000 per month, maybe a little bit more, but around that range is kind of what we're looking. So when I talk 75 to 100,000, those are the ranges that we're looking at. Um, and obviously facility costs are all over the place according to your city. I would encourage you though to look into things that are like, you know, maybe not prime real estate, but still are decent, ex decent place to be exposed to the public. Um, churches are one thing people will drive to if you're, I think there was a church in Champaign that used to use this slogan, church al a church alive is worth the drive. I don't remember who that was, but somebody down in the south end of Champaign. Uh, the, like, that's true. Like, people will drive around them. When we came in our first building, um, Rob, you probably couldn't even find the first building hardly, could you, when you came down? <laughs> but you had to turn at one place and turn at the second place, and then we were back in behind a bunch of kind of run-down buildings. It worked. You know, it worked short-term. Is it ideal? No. So you want the ideal space. And I'll, t I'll say that, and then you'll hear people talk about it. They want prime real estate space. Here's what I can tell you. If you want prime real estate pace, space, you will pay dearly for it. That's why it's prime real estate space. So don't go into prime real estate space and expect to pe get it in cheaply. You just, it's, it doesn't happen. Um, we generally look, you know, like that 1,500 to 3,000 range. Uh, balance that with what is, what is the building size you're looking for, what's the average that where you are located. And you can easily do that by going on the internet and start and check things out. That's not too hard to do. Um, advertising expense. Uh, runs, when you talk about direct mailing, um, $3,000 to $6,000 is about what it runs. Um, Laura, you were involved in some of that design work that we did. Kind of, we did some of this differently, but some of this we designed actually ourselves, right? Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, we, we look at... I should probably let you talk into this. Yeah, for direct mail, is this on? Okay. Direct mailing, we always look at, you know, the different markets that we're approaching. Yeah, I feel like every launch is very customizable because you got to know, you know, the community that you're emerging in, what makes sense in communication for that. You know, I will say direct mail is a very traditional model of marketing. And, you know, some people are like, oh, you know, how does that work? We continue to see results. I, I do think, you know, as time goes on, we continue to shift and continue to build our social media. There's a lot of guerrilla marketing you can do out there before you even begin to put significant dollars towards it. But just know, based on who you're wanting to, who that audience is, you're still going to have a layer of the traditional marketing, if you will. So yeah, graphics, you know, like when we did a, a Bloomington versus a Sullivan, you know, the look and feel is always different because it's, it's just a different, it's more rural versus somewhat of a metro area. And, you know, I always am a proponent of don't be safe in that. Have something that is captivating visually that you see, and, you know, and have fun and be inviting and, and, you know, have things that are sticky, you know, messaging that's sticky that's going to make them ask, hmm, what's this about? Or, you know, go to the next step. So that's kind of, we talk about direct marketing, direct mails, that's kind of what we're doing. Um, for instance, at the campus that we launched in Sullivan, we actually took pictures of our local theater, which have a we have a live theater in Sullivan. Uh, we actually took pictures and put them on as our postcards. So there's, there's different things you can do. Be creative. Um, you probably have creative people on your staff that can do those kind of things that will be happy to help you out. So if you do, that would be awesome. Uh, but do something, like Laura said, do something that's captivating. Like be a little out of the box, okay? Um, we recently had launched, there was a church launched a campus not too far from where we are, 
Um, we get this big postcard. We only get one. Real generic looking. I, I would just encourage you, if you're going to do one, don't do it. Okay? Because you need more than one shot. And so people say, oh, we're going to save some money. We're going to only do one. It doesn't do any good. It doesn't, it doesn't call to action. Like we did some research on it. Market people tell you, do not do one. You're wasting your money. It doesn't call people to action. You want action out of people. So um, if you're doing direct mailing, those are the things to do. You know, look at maybe look at your area. Where are you located? How many people do you want to reach? And that will change all those pricings too. You know, like I said, we said 12,000. Maybe you're 15 to 20,000. I don't, I don't know what your areas are. Um, look at radio. Look at paper. Look at signage. Uh, Laura does a great job with signage. What are the first impressions? Um, because your signage makes a big difference. Um, how you identify your church, and then keep it across campuses. Don't don't vary it. Don't mess with it. Uh, we didn't do that well early on. We really needed to, to be more specific. For instance, at our campus, we launched. We I got somebody local to make the signs. They pulled up almost the right color, but not quite. So it looked like Christmas. So it was red and green, like you know, tacky, right? But uh, those are the things you want to make sure of. Do it well right off the bat. Talk with somebody who's done it. Um, you know, budget things for your outreach, like budget. I had 500 to to $1,000 is what we often consider for um, budgeting for outreach during that time of launch. So getting ready to launch and thinking about that. Um, think about in signage, you know, maybe thinking about spending 1000 to $2,000. I forgot to give you that number uh, on signage. But remember, it's first impressions. If you do it poorly, it's probably going to communicate exactly that value to your community. So keep that in mind. Um, kids furniture and equipment, you know, a thousand to two thousand dollars doesn't buy a lot, but generally amongst a church, if you've got it coming from a, a larger church, you, usually there's kids equipment and stuff around that you can buy that you can fill in with. So do that if you, if you would, um, we'll save a little bit of money. Then have some cafe and connection space. We probably undervalued that a bit on a couple of different occasions. It's not wise. Uh, don't, uh, don't undervalue the connection space. In a larger church, you have a commons area, right? In a smaller church, you need a commons area as well, somewhere where people can sit down and have coffee together. Um, we had a really small one. Our first building was a, uh, the whole building was only 5,400 square feet. Um, and our commons area was only, was only uh, 20 by 40. So we're trying to run three services and we're running 350 people through there, if that gives you kind of an idea. It was really congested, but uh, it's important to have that. Like it's important to have some hangout space for people. I always kind of chuckle because coming from big church to smaller church, sometimes we value things we think are different in big church, right? It's still the same people walking through your door. Like, show value to those people and, and let them know that they are important by giving them some space. Um, it's important. I think, t I think tech is probably the largest expenditure that we have uh, most of the time. And if you look at the budget, you'll see that in the multi-site manual that you have. If you don't have one, you can pick one up in the back. Um, when you're looking at... Send it spending anywhere from fifty to or from seventy five to a hundred thousand. You're looking at spending anywhere from probably thirty five thousand to about sixty, like on just on tech stuff. So that's just on lights, sound, and basic tech. Thirty thousand, thirty five thousand, right, Chris? Buys you very little. <laughs> Chris does very very little. I don't say that, but it it's it's just is really tough. Um, and because people are so used to having really good video and really good sound, their expectation level is pretty high, okay? Yeah, and I'm going to repeat that just for this, but Chris is just saying, go into HD, HD right off the bat. Don't go into standard def. Um, we're just in a different place now in society. People have expectations of being standard def, and if you, if, you do, if you go down that next level, you'll just be in two years looking to spend more money to get back into what you need to be into. So um, I would agree with that. You have also got in front of you or maybe you don't have it in front of you, but you should have had a sheet um, that's got about, talks about streaming and um, some different things. It's got some, a nice little colored thing. That is uh, courtesy of Jeff Sanders, and who is a, who's with On Point Design. It's his company out of, um, yeah, Olivia, Washington, which is out somewhere close to Seattle-ish area. Uh, but he, d he travels around. He actually does our tech advising here. Um, he's like oversees a lot of what we do and has installed almost, not all of our equipment, but much of our equipment here. Um, it's, it's really worth having somebody really good for tech. Like it's, it's really worth your time and money to spend that.
So, and the, yeah, just reiterating, make sure you build connections with your audiovisual people and, 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 and stay clean with it. Make sure those, those things are clean. Test it, retest it. Um, if you want to turn people off quickly to a video message, just have poor video and that, that'll, that'll take care of it. Like if you're, if you're a campus pastor, <laughs> I probably shouldn't tell you this, but I'm telling you anyway. Uh, if you're a campus pastor who really wants to speak, just have poor video quality and, <laughs> and everybody will leave, right? Because that's how it works. Like people's expectations are high. They want what's best. Um, so that brings a lot of just, you know, different kinds of things. So those, those are kind of things that just to think about, to kind of process through. Um, in looking at the budget, which is within the multi-site manual that you have, you know, have expectation levels of what are you expecting people to give to? Like when we talk about budgets, so budgets, we talk, we often think about budgets being spending, right? Budgets are also income. You don't have the income, you don't spend, right? So too many times we kind of want to undersell the part of, I got to know how much money is coming in so that I know how much we can spend, right? So have some goals. Like when you start a campus, um, what are your expectations? $750 a person we think is a good goal for a local campus, a more local campus, 650 for somebody that's out away from here. So that's, the way that works is that's an average. So if you have 400 people at your church at $650 times 400, that would be kind of a budget that you're looking at, right? Um, and then gauge health based on that. So attendance is one way of gauging health, but attendance isn't everything. It's also giving, it's small groups, it's baptisms. There's a whole list of things that you need to really think through what are the things that we value and what are we going to do to make sure those things are doing, that they're doing what we hope they're doing, okay? They're reaching people. So I would encourage you as in this whole budgeting process to figure out what are your giving expectations, how many people are you going to have, how much do you expect them to give, and then set a budget based on that um, for that first year. And that's, it's really hard to do. Um, Tim Wheeler, who is our campus pastor in Charleston, who was the newest one out, told me, he said, I hate doing budget because I don't know where I'm going to be. And I said, that's, you know, that is true. You don't know where you're going to be. Um, so you have to just kind of work your way through it. Many of you have probably worked with budgets. Here's the deal with campus pastors for the most part. Most of the campus pastors or many of campus pastors have never been senior pastors, right? So who generally works with finances the most? It's like an executive pastor and a senior pastor, right? So a lot of campus pastors just need to be trained. Like they need to know what are you dealing with. Our central support team here. Um, actually consists of Laura's team, which does all the communications. We also have um, Scott Joellenbeck, who deals with personnel and with budgeting and the money and all those kind of things, right? Uh, so that's kind of a central support thing. So kind of the expenditures really come back, but the campus pastor needs to be able to have influence over that budget to know where things are going, what's being spent, what can you spend, what shouldn't you spend. Um, we also have champions in five areas, and I'm going to wrap up here just in a minute because I want to make sure I leave time for questions. Um, when we launched our third campus, we went to having champions over things like our Kingdom Kids. Uh, our Kingdom Kids is our kids' ministry, obviously, and then Revolution, which is our junior high and high school ministry, worship, and then also assimilation, which we call Connect, and also small groups. So we have somebody who champions those. Those champions are resources for those directors that are out on the campus, okay? If you want to know more about that, I can tell you and draw it out for you and kind of show you. Um, but they resource. They don't have direct authority. The campus pastor has direct authority, and those people are resources. So we're trying to kind of figure that out right now. There's kind of two words that we keep throwing around, which you'll hear from a lot of different multi-sites. It's, it's the word family and the word franchise, okay? Are we a family or are we a franchise? And it's a great question, okay? We're still trying to kind of work our way through that whole thing because, you know, franchises are like... McDonald's, right? So you make the Big Mac like this. You don't put bacon on the Big Mac. You always make it this way. And if somebody rogue decides to go do their own thing, they're like, well, you can't do that. You're a McDonald's franchise. If we're family, we say more like, well, so maybe you like your McDonald's. You like your Big Macs with bacon, so you can make them with bacon if you want to, right? But nobody else does. So we kind of got to decide who we are as a church. And I, I want to just encourage you, if you've not launched or you've only launched one or two campuses, Get on that, okay? And uh, I'll tell you more in the next session when Corey and I are talking about some, some of our experiences with how that's worked and not worked. <laughs> some of them have been so great. Some have been good. So any questions? Yes. I'll let you go. Two questions. Um, one, 
what what's what's the process of hiring? Do you hire like a tech person and worship person? Like, do you pay them? I know you pay the the campus pastor, but the other stuff. And um, if so, do you, especially for the tech, if there's not like a volunteer competent for that, do you go outside the church for that, or what's that process like? That's a great question. Uh, do we go outside the church for those? We generally, we have not. Um, as far as hiring, we don't, we haven't hired anyone. We don't hire anyone. The campus pastor is the only person that gets any amount of salary to start. That's how we've launched. Now, might that change? Possibly. Um, I think it depends on a couple things. One thing is what size are you launching at? If you've got a large church that you're launching, you probably need to just look at being really good at it and maybe hiring somebody to come out and do it. Or maybe taking somebody like Chris, who's working at one campus full-time and saying, we'll pay you a day a week to come out and get tech, get a tech guy trained. So tech, actually, Chris oversees our tech at our multi-sites and kind of helps with training he with, with another guy. Um, so we kind of have advi- advisors over them, so they're not on their own. Is that helpful? And then your other question was hiring anybody else. Okay. Somebody had a hand back there. Yeah. Let me just oh, I was just curious what the, what is the central support line item? How does that work? I'm curious. Good question. <laughs> How does central support line item work? That's a good question. Um, central support, if you look at the budget, I don't have one up here with me, but the, the central support line item, we actually give back to central support. So every, every campus spends a certain amount that goes back to central support. So in this particular case here, you're looking at 40% of your, whatever you take in, bring into the campus in giving, 40% of that goes back to central support, which takes care of things like personnel and budgeting and uh, accounting. And it also goes for our, like our Vineyard USA fees, uh, missions, which would be, we support two missions primarily, which are China Taiwan Partnership and Mexico. So our money goes towards that. So not every campus doesn't have its own mission outreach. We are all doing the same mission outreach. So that's what that goes towards. Um, some of that goes to actually pay salaries of central support. Like, you know, like Laura's team is central support. Uh, Scott's team who's financed is central support. Um, like Happy, who's your senior pastor, is considered central support. So that goes back to pay that. Yeah. You had used a rule of thumb of about $650 per person for attendees. Is are you, that's adults exclusively, or how do you how do you work that? We we would say say pers- just attendance, like gross attendance over the church is kind of how that comes. Yeah, so that's gross attendance. That's the reason it's so small. I mean, $650 a year is pretty seems pretty insignificant for tithing, right? Not many make, people are making $6,500. Uh, a year, <laughs> although I have a few probably would say that, but, yep. Uh, you mentioned that you had five campuses. Can you describe the site selection for uh, the number two and three and four and five? Yeah, site selection for our campuses. You're wondering how we selected them, how we decided on them? Okay, that's a great question. Um, our campus, which was the first one out of the box, was primarily decided on, we were driving an hour to church, um, my family and I, realizing that we weren't impacting anybody where we lived. Although, over those years, we did that for 18 years, um, over those years what happened was we had more and more people coming from those areas. So we were, we were overseeing five small groups. At one point, about 50 people were driving up here. But we weren't gaining anything. Like, those people weren't involved in serving. They weren't, because they couldn't be. It was too far away. So that became, for us, became a missional thing. Is like, how do we reach our community better? we launch a campus where we live, right? So that's how that came to be. Um, Danville, which was the second one out of the box, kind of happened the same way. It was a missional, I would say missional more than anything else. It wasn't a space thing. We weren't full here. Uh, It was more missional because we were further away. Um, I think actually probably all four of them to to most of the point became that. Uh, Paxton, which was the third one out. Um, Jim and Dee Dee Wood, who were the campus pastors there, were from that area. Um, all three of those were actually from the areas. Like, they were actually local people who lived in those towns for a number of years that launched those campuses that had come here. So that was probably the most. Um, Charleston, which had launched, that was a situation where Tim actually moved here um, from New York as a pastor, 
and we'd been looking at Charleston and looking at Charleston and looking at Charleston and nothing was happening. Um, we, so he, we had the opportunity to launch there and he had, we had a guy to do it. So we had a campus pastor he, and he kind of liked the area, had been from that area originally uh, years ago, not very far away from there. And so um, it's a university town. So Eastern Illinois University is there. Um, Hap really wanted to be there partly because this is a university town. And we thought, catch the word thought, we thought there was some similarities. And there is some, but there's not as many as we thought there were. It's been a little bit challenging. I'm just being honest. It's been a little bit challenging because we thought we knew kind of what we're getting into, but we really didn't know. So it's like do your homework really, really, really well. Um, it really helps if you can find a campus pastor who has a real heart and a real mission for where they're going. Your chances of being are starting well are are much higher. I would I would say this. I would say, and Ben's sitting up here in the front row. Ben's and Leah. I don't know if you guys met them, but in the green shirt, but they're looking in Muhammad, which is 20, 15 minutes from here probably, right? Um, but they moved to Muhammad back in May, right, of last year, July, um, with the idea that we're going to launch something over there. It just works so much better if we, if we think ahead like that and we're moving before we're ready to start launching something. You get community built. People know who you are. You make relationships with people. Those are just, in, in rural Illinois, it's it has become a non-negotiable for us like if you're going to be a campus pastor we want you to live in the community um and i was talking to the guys from yeah david from overland park and they were saying the same thing like they've got neighboring towns but they're different so like you cross the line you know if you're in overland park or you know if you're in olathe right that was the two and they're like there's a different feel to the town so uh, it's really interesting like it's just one of those things where i just think there's no there's no um, shortcutting the system to have the campus pastor to have a missional heart for the community they're trying to reach. Yeah. There, there are some lessons learned. Are there? I'll just repeat the question. Are there lessons learned from the one that didn't go well? So yes, uh, great question. Several things we learned. One thing we learned that was an adopted church. So it was a church that the pastor left, and they asked if we would adopt them in. Um, we heard people saying that's really challenging. We didn't listen very well um, to what we were told. That was the first mistake. Secondly, we were going into a town which is just a few minutes, 45 minutes away, um, which is a conservative, um, more white collar, or uh, Ur- Urbana would be more less cons- would be less conservative. Let's put it that way, much less conservative than the town we're going to. So. That created a real challenge because so we just couldn't, it wasn't a crossover we could make. So we, we actually had a gal who was a great gal, well-trained, ready to go. But we were going into, remember, a really conservative town, right? Um, it was just really challenging. It wasn't, it didn't work well. And I, that wasn't our only problem, but it was one of the things, that was just an illustration of what we didn't research well. Like we should have researched that better. The building wasn't in a great spot. We kind of inherited a building that was in a spot that was really challenging to get to. Uh, needed a lot of work. Um, yeah, so we just soon found out that we were investing a lot of time and energy into something that was really tra- was really challenging uh, because it wasn't really us. So we didn't take the time to make sure the DNA was right in the church, that who it was. So even though it was, it was a vineyard, um, their DNA and ours didn't really match up real well. So when we made that change, we should have, looking back now, and this is what all the people tell you, they tell you, Go in, make sure everybody's with you, and then shut the church down, and then start over. Lesson learned. We didn't do it. We didn't think it was necessary. Um, so, if that helps you answer that question. But um, more, the issues were more just people, culture. Yeah, not really knowing who we were, um, feeling kind of like I don't know if I like this place anymore. I think initially, I think we lost 50% of the people just right off the top. And so it's, you know, it creates a challenge. You're small, you're small struggling church, and then it takes you in half. And now you're down to 40 people, and it's hard to gain it back. Um, we gained some momentum back and got back somewhat, but just never really. It, we had some other issues in there in leadership later that didn't help us any, that caused us to continue to struggle. Yeah. Mm-hmm.
<laughs> yeah, there's some people who do it well. There's a book. Uh, Jim Temberlin wrote a book about church mergers. Um, he's a, I've talked to him before. And he has some great stuff. So if you're going to do mergers, read read up on it. Read his book. Um, he's kind of a multi-site guy and has some really good insight into like, do it, don't do it. Here's the things that are bad ideas. Here are the things that are better ideas. Uh, Jim Tumberlin, T-O-M-B-E-R-L-I-N, Tumberlin. Yes. One question for you and one for Linda. You said you teach one out of the four times. Is that content that's across the board for all the campuses, like the same content for each week? Yes, that content is the same, very similar. It's We use an outline, so we have a preaching team here, uh, Diane Lehman, who is our senior pastor, one of our senior pastors. She's actually the preaching team lead, and so she kind of lays out the content and like here's the scriptures you're gonna that we're gonna use in this series here's the ones for these days um here's an outline that is you can use or you have you know kind of stay within um everyone becomes their own but we're within the same subject matter we're in the same series we're definitely in the same line so it's not a one-off like it's not we we don't do that often where we just take one off sunday we don't do that very often at all so try to stay pretty well that way. Yeah. Is it Linda? Um, <laughs> Laura, sorry. <laughs> Start with an L. Um, as far as the branding, so, so you talked about having the similar branding. Is there, do you add to that, like, the flavor of each campus? Like, do you promote how it's different, or what does that look like? And a little detail question like bulletins do you, does the core staff print all those and then give that to the churches or you you have your infrastructure for each church that does all that well i've been on staff for about three years so it's been a journey because you know for banna to have close to 35 years of history you, know, you get kind of used to process and what you're doing and so I am a firm believer in holding brand integrity. So your first part of your question of how's your brand work? Well, your brand's your brand's your brand. Because that's your first impression. And that's what builds, tells a story before, you know, relationships are even built, in my opinion, come from that marketing side. So I can talk about that a long time. I would say, so we lead with that. Now, pieces that are customizable, that gets more into the flavor of the programming and look and feel of programming. But ultimately, I'd say your brand is solid. And so you're not finessing. And so, yeah, when I started and I went over to Danville, Illinois, and saw red, white, and blue, I'm like, what's happening? <laughs> you know? And so it's, it, it's just really capturing with your core team the importance of what that messaging means. And then regarding to um, like printed material, at the time that we decided to be a week, that when we came together and we were all the same week, that really changed the, you know, the style of how we were going to communicate some of our printed material because now you don't have that, that space of knowing, you know, we have to deliver the, not only the video and all that product, everything now is the same week. So we went to, a, uh, a monthly calendar that's printed. I think, you know, that that's becoming an archaic thing too, you know, just the printed material handout. But we went to a monthly instead of a weekly, saved tremendous amount of dollars in our budget. Let me just say that. That's really important. But what it also did is help streamline the messaging, getting people thinking forward because anytime you're adding a multi-site, now you're, you're governing more programming across the board. Um, did they answer your question? Right. Our bulletin is a program calendar, is what we refer to it. So we've kind of gotten away from, through, through social media, our e-newsletter, um, other communication platforms, you know, we'll, we'll be sharing, you know, who's a speaking pastor, uh, and then try to have very good slide support you know, at the time during our weekend experience. But we really are going to more, the print material is what's happening at a programming level. Yeah. It is all printed here. Yeah. 
Uh, not full time. We have uh, we have the magnificent seven, one being behind the camera right there. Uh, Derek, uh, we have a, a graphic designer, and then we have a video production. I have a production manager, kind of a print room, handles all the printed material, a uh, couple project managers, and then I'm kind of the air traffic controller <laughs> looking through all of it. Yeah. Can you describe your social media platform? Mm hmm. You know, I feel like if you're if you're starting in social media, there's so many things. You know, you can get on Facebook about every week and it changes, too. So, you know, there's there's many, many layers of social media. I would say pick one or two and stick with it for at least a year. Uh, you know, when I started, even three years ago, we had Facebook groups. We didn't have pages. We had everything. Every It, it was kind of ADD, really. I mean, candidly, it just there was a lot of things going on. So, so we took some baby steps and we said, let's let's corral this. Let's create a page for each of our campus locations, and let's do things strategically. Let's talk about when you know when are good times to post, when are not good times to post. You know, when are you? You know, I'm an advocate. Anybody that works with me, I say, if you say everything, you say nothing. <laughs> so you can really just put too much noise out there for people to understand. So, you know, pick a couple of social media pieces, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I, you know, pick the things that you feel like is culturally fit for your congregation and run with that, but put strategy behind it, too. So, less is more and do it well and have a plan. Yeah. Mm hmm We have... That was another transition when we went to multi-site because we needed to create a vehicle. Again, I look at your website as your foundational tool. That's where you need to have the comprehensive amount of information about your church. And so we partnered with a group called Fishhook. They're out of Indianapolis. And they actually customized a website that had different layers so you can actually select your campus. And now all the information, for the most part, is looking like... I'm in Sullivan, I'm in Paxton, I'm in Urbana. And uh, some of the you know, basic vision and things are, are similar content. But that was really helpful then to make sure that I feel like it's, it's still my campus, but yet I'm seeing the one church mentality. But, yeah. Mm hmm yes. Yeah. Um, is really with central support is keeping it all together. Like we had kind of we had some access for some campuses at different points. That was a bad idea. <laughs> it just it just got muddled. So 